Okay, so in this video we're going to take a look at how we model a substance changing phase as we either heat it or cool it down. So the first thing we're going to look at is the relationship between kinetic energy of molecules and temperature. And we're then going to talk about why we always talk about average kinetic energy and temperature and not just kinetic energy. Then we're going to look at how the temperature of substance varies with time if we're supplying thermal energy at constant rate or equally if we're removing thermal energy at constant rate too. And we're also going to describe the energy transfers occurring during different stages of that graph and explain the length and direction of those lines. Okay, so let's get started. So first of all, we're going to look at the relationship between kinetic energy and temperature. So we're going to look at what that relationship is and why we have to talk about average kinetic energy. So, so if we plot a graph of temperature measured in Kelvin against average kinetic energy, we would get a graph that looks like this, a straight line passing through the origin, which we'll often describe as a directly proportional graph. Okay, so we... The, a straight line through the origin is one way of describing a directly proportional relationship, but there is also another more mathematical way of describing it too, which we're going to look at as well. So we could also have described this graph using the coordinates. And if it's directly proportional, if we take the y coordinate and divide it by the x coordinate at any given point, it should be a constant. So what that means is that if we do the kinetic energy at point number one divided by the temperature, at point one, that should be equal to a constant, and it's the same constant if we do kinetic energy two divided by temperature two. And so what we can do is equate those two together and see that kinetic energy divided by temperature is a constant value that also describes a directly proportional relationship. Okay, so that's the relationship between average kinetic energy and temperature. Now let's look at why we keep using the word average. So. The first thing is, I, we're going to think about a liquid for now. We could use this for any of the states of matter, but I'm just going to use a liquid. So the first thing to bear in mind is that if you have a group of atoms forming a liquid, they will not all have the same kinetic energy as each other. You can see some of them shown in red have a, a higher amount of kinetic energy, some of them in blue have a lower, and we've got some of them shown in yellow, which is somewhere in the middle. So. One of the things that you notice is that there are very few extreme ones. So there are very few high kinetic energy, very few low, and a lot in the middle, the, all around about the average kinetic energy value. But the key is they all have different. And there's actually a very nice way of modeling this. It's called a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution graph that looks like this. So we can see that we've got kinetic energy on the x-axis and the number of molecules or atoms with that kinetic energy. So you can see that the kinetic energy that the majority have is somewhere in the middle, but that there are some on either end. And that's why we keep talking about average kinetic energy, because there is a variation in kinetic energy amongst the atoms. Okay. So that's looking at. So now we're going to look at what happens if we supply a substance with thermal energy at a constant rate? And it equally works if we're removing it too. Okay, so we, if we were to take something that was a solid, supply thermal energy at a constant rate, which means we're supplying a constant amount of energy every second, we would get a graph that looks like this if we had temperature on the y-axis against time on the x-axis. So this is an intriguing graph in itself, but there are a few questions that we're going to talk about to do with this. So why are all of the lines a straight line? Okay, seems a fair question to ask. Why are there some points where the temperature is constant? Um, because that seems odd, because we're putting energy in, and we don't seem to be getting anything in return. So that seems kind of violate conservation of energy. So anyway, let's take a look at that. So why are there all straight line sections? So we're looking specifically at the sections where temperature is increasing. So A to B, C to D, and E to F. So during those stages, thermal energy is being transferred into kinetic energy. So we're giving all of the molecules more kinetic energy, some more than others, but 
we're sort of we're generally we're increasing the average kinetic energy of the atoms so if we're supplying thermal energy at a constant rate that's got to mean the kinetic energy increases at a constant rate and since temperature is directly proportional to the average kinetic energy therefore temperature also has to increase at a constant rate so that's why we a to b c to d e to f are all straight line type graphs kinetic energy increases at constant rate so does temperature okay so that's our first question but what about what's happening in the sections where the temperature is constant so first of all b to c is where we're changing from a solid phase into a liquid phase and d to e is where we're turning from a liquid into a gas phase so those two sections show a phase change and one of the interesting things to observe is that during a phase change temperature stays constant which is a bit odd when you think about it considering that you're heating it okay so why is there no violation of conservation of energy so first thing if temperature is staying the same that tells us that the average kinetic energy has stayed the same too because those two things are directly proportional to each other so during a phase change kinetic energy doesn't increase so what's actually changing during a phase change is the separation between atoms is increasing so if you go from a solid to a liquid you're getting an increase in separation if you go from a liquid to a gas you get an increase in separation and that means a different kind of energy is increasing and we call it electric potential energy and the reason we call it that is because the atoms are all attracted to one another through what's called the electrostatic force due to charge essentially so during a phase change thermal energy is now transferred into electric potential energy instead and that's why we're not violating conservation of energy so how does this actually work so i'm going to try and explain this a little bit more using an analogy of a spring so if you have a spring that is unstretched there is no tension force in the spring but as we stretch a spring we start to get a tension force pulling back on us trying to unstretch it and if we do work against that tension force we store elastic potential energy in the spring and that can be released when you let go of the spring so that's what's happening there so essentially it's the same kind of thing with atoms so atoms are attracted to one another through the electrostatic force and depending on what atoms they are those forces are different sizes so if we want to separate them we have to do work against those forces which means we're increasing their electric potential energy or we're storing energy in the form of electric potential energy so in this instance we're not applying a force to do it in this instance we're supplying thermal energy to have the same effect but it works out kind of the same okay so a bit more interesting a bit more high level question at this point why does the change bc take a shorter amount of time uh, rather than the d to e which takes a long period of time and the the real key to this is thinking about the separation in each of the states or phases of matter okay so let's take a look so looking at our diagrams of solids liquids and gases this helps us understand why this might be the case so we are supplying thermal energy at a constant rate and we so therefore we can conclude from the graph it takes more energy to go from a liquid to a gas at least generally so the reason being is that the change in separation when you go from a liquid to a gas is much bigger so a solid to a liquid yes we increase the separation but we don't increase it that much whereas from a liquid to a gas the separation changes dramatically which means there's a much larger change in electric potential energy between liquid and gas and that means we have to supply far far more energy to make that transition and so that's the reason that uh, the second transition it takes much longer it takes more energy essentially okay so that concludes the sections that i'm going to look at so at this point the the point, important thing for you to do is go can i do each of these things having watched the video and if you can't now is the time to go back and look at the various sections to make sure that you can